Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag, the show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I am the uh, senior producer over here at Collider Video, and I am so glad you decided to make this little show a part of your Saturday. I'm actually in the office right now. It's about 6.05 a.m., uh, and I'm recording Mailbag this early on Saturday morning. Why? Because, uh, as many of you know, and we talked about this last week, we are launching a recap show network here on Collider Video for a long time going way back to when we were still at AMC and things like that, people have been asking us to do television. Now, at AMC, obviously, that was never going to happen because we were a movie theater company, not a TV company. But now that we're over here at Collider, we can spread our wings a little bit and get into television. And we said for a long time we're going to get involved in television in a big way. And uh, we still have a, a new show that uh, we have coming out called... Uh, it's going to be a short show, but it's going to be weekly called uh, Should You Watch It? And it's going to be about shows that you can binge watch. And if you should invest some time in those shows, whether it's on Netflix or uh, Amazon Prime or Hulu, whatever. Um, so that's coming up. But then we said we're actually going to do recap shows. Now, we're going to start small. And uh, we mentioned that we're starting with uh, Blacklist, Arrow, Flash, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Empire, and Supergirl are the ones that we're going to be starting with. And if you guys watch our recap shows and if you enjoy them and if they aren't total crap, uh, then we'll expand and we'll grow and we'll, we'll increase the number of shows that we're doing. But it's going to be a neat little experiment for us. Like, we've never really done this. I'm excited to see how it goes. And, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. No big deal. At least we tried something new. But I'm excited about it. I have a lot of hope for it. So, and anyway, today, Saturday we are doing our first round of casting. And so we are holding interviews and auditions from like uh, 10 a.m. today all the way till about 7 p.m. tonight. And then we're auditioning again on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And we're hoping by the end of this week, we're going to have all uh, the casting done. We're going to have the, the cast for all of our recap shows in place. Um, and it starts today with a very long Saturday. So that's why I'm doing this so early in the morning. So thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, hey, listen, just so you know right off the front, if you want to see your question on Mailbag or on Movie Talk Monday through Friday, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, please understand, we get like over a thousand questions every week and we only have time to answer like about 30 questions every week. So 30 out of a thousand, you understand there's not a great shot that you're going to get your question on, but if you'd like to take a chance, see if we can get your question on the air, send an email to us anytime. Once again, that's collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, with that out of the way, Let's get to the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Batman Galino, who writes, Hey, Collider crew, huge fan of the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. I wanted to get your opinion on The Iron Giant getting released for a limited run. I saw the movie many times as a kid, but seeing the trailer in high definition and after not watching the movie for a while, it gave me goosebumps watching it in high definition. I'm excited to see it on the big screen. Would love to hear if you guys are going to see it as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, that classic film, Iron Giant, which I think caught a lot of people, people by surprise with just how good it is, um, it's getting re-released again for a limited engagement. It's been remastered on September 30th. And I think it's only two days that's going to be in theaters again. One is September 30th and then like a week later on October 4th or something like that. You'll, you'll have to look up the specific date. Um, and... They just released the other day a digitally remastered new trailer for the re-release. And then it's upcoming Blu-ray release. And it just looked magnificent. It is a fantastic trailer. They, the, the folks over there did such a good job of capturing the essence of the Iron Giant in a trailer that felt exciting and gave me chills too watching it. Um, it was really something special. I'm super excited about it. And so, yeah, you, you can bet that I'm going to be in theater on September 30th to watch The Iron Giant, where movies were meant to be seen on a big screen with an audience again. And that's going to be really special. Now, something really interesting happened just like yesterday. Vin Diesel got on his Facebook. And Vin Diesel is one of the most prolific dudes on communicating with his fans on his social media. He's often announcing stuff to his fans first on his social media channels, specifically on Facebook. He's really great at that. So anyway, Vin Diesel gets on Facebook the other day and he starts talking about so excited for the re-release of Iron Giant, one of, one of my favorite characters I've ever done. And then he throws this in. 
Don't be surprised when Warner Brothers announces an Iron Giant 2. Now, are they actually going to announce an Iron Giant 2? I don't know. It would seem weird that Warner Brothers would let, if they were going to announce something as big as that, that they would let Vin Diesel break the story on his Facebook page. Uh, and I, I don't think Vin Diesel is the type of guy who he would break something like that without Warner Brothers permission. That would kind of be a little sneaky of him. But hey, if they are going to do it, that's amazing. I don't know how well an Iron Giant sequel would do today because not as many people have seen the first Iron Giant as that movie deserves to have people see it. If you haven't seen the Iron Giant, watch it. It's great. The animation style may throw some people with modern sensibilities off a little bit but because clearly the animation style looks a little bit dated, granted. But who cares? It's an amazing film. It really is. It's just breathtaking uh, in its scope and the emotion, the heartstrings on it. You've got to wonder, how can a big giant robot that barely speaks pull on your emotional heartstrings and the movie does it? Um, so, I, But I also don't know. It's certainly a movie that doesn't need a sequel. Um, and I'm not quite sure how you handle a sequel if you do one. I can say all that, but the reality is, if they did indeed announce a sequel to The Iron Giant, I would be very excited about it. All right, with that out of the way, let's move on to question number two. And the next question comes to us from Christopher Slavin, who writes, Hey there, Collider Movie Crew. I love the show and look, and, uh, look forward to making you part of my daily routine. Well, thank you so much, Christopher. My question is about Star Wars Episode Seven, and a question that hit me with the 15-second teaser recently released on Instagram. It's been a Star Wars tradition that someone loses a limb to a lightsaber cut in just about every movie. If Finn mixes it up with Kylo Ren in a lightsaber duel, who loses an arm? My money is on the former Stormtrooper. Thanks, and keep up the great work. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Christopher. And yeah, if you don't know what he's talking about, uh, just a couple of days ago, might have even been yesterday, either yesterday or on Thursday, um, Lucasfilm released... It was Thursday. A like 15 second tease. You can't even call it a trailer. Like 15 second tease spot on Instagram. And they showed one shot we haven't seen before, which is like BB-8 um, with Daisy Ridley kind of looking up like this. Nothing big. The big shot, though, that got everybody excited was that you saw a shot of Kylo Ren, like we've seen him for a long time in that first Star Wars teaser, in the forest in the dark with snow falling and pulls out his lightsaber. But then it cuts to something we haven't seen before. It cuts away from Kylo Ren in that forest, but with John Boyega holding his lightsaber at the same time. We've always wondered, what's he pulling out his lightsaber for? Ever saw, since we saw that first Star Wars Episode Seven trailer back in December... We saw Kylo Ren walking through the woods from behind them, pull out his lightsaber, and the lightsaber turns on. We thought, well, okay, well, what's that guy pulling out his lightsaber for? What's going on? It seems like something bad's about to go down. Uh, and now we know what it is. He's about to face John Boyega. Um, and yeah, you're right. There is this tradition in the Star Wars films, at least if you look at the, the, um, the original trilogy, the only true trilogy in Star Wars, by the way. Uh, if you look at that, you know, in the first one, the dude in the cantina, Obi-Wan chops his arm off. Then you go into Empire Strikes Back, Luke loses his hand. Then Return of the Jedi, Luke returns the favor, cuts off Vader's hand. Um, I said, I remember talking to Christian about this. Because in that show, in the Star Wars animated show Rebels, I remember when they showed a teaser trailer for the upcoming season two. And they showed Darth Vader about to have a lightsaber duel um, with uh, Kanan. And I remember saying to Christian, that better be a one-sided fight. That better be a very one-sided fight. Vader should be able to crush this guy. Vader, who's been doing what he does all this time, and Kanan, who trained as a, a young little boy Padawan, he was a youngling, and then doesn't really pick up his lightsaber again until in his adult life. I said, Vader, that better be a one-sided fight. This fight, if there is a fight between Kylo Ren and and uh, the John Boyega character, that better be a one-sided fight. If, if I understand the story, and there's so much about the story we still don't understand, right? But if Kylo Ren has indeed been, you know, a, a force user most of or all of his life, and if the John Boyega character is just figuring out he is, he is force sensitive, then that better be a one-sided fight in favor of Kylo Ren. 
And then maybe the next couple of movies can be, you know, the John Boyega character can take on like a Luke Skywalker journey where now he's got to learn to grow and develop in force skills to the point that he can face Kylo Ren again at some point. But that's assuming a lot. That's assuming that the John Boyega character hasn't been using the force his whole life. That's assuming that Kylo Ren has been using the force. His whole, there's a lot of assumptions that I'm making here and, and they could be way off. But if we're just going on my perceptions right now that Kylo Ren's been a force user most of his life and he's very, uh, you know, skilled in it and he's very advanced in it and the John Boyega character is not, then to me, that better be a one-sided fight when it finally does actually happen. All right, thanks a lot for the question. Let's move on to the next one. And the next one comes to us from Theoph Theophilus Annie Aqua, who writes, Which movie will gross more in the end? Batman vs. Superman? or Captain America Civil War. Batman vs. Superman is the first ever on-screen appearance of these two most iconic superheroes together, plus the debut of the most popular superheroine, Wonder Woman. Furthermore, it is the beginning of the DCEU. Uh, look, look, first of all, let me, let me get this straight. Let me, let me get this straight. I understand DC is trying to um, separate themselves and, and make themselves unique, by not calling it cinematic universe, now they call it the DCEU, the DC Expanded Universe. Shut up. It's a cinematic universe. I know you're trying to, oh no, we're making up our own name. We don't want to look like Marvel. We're making up our own name. Okay, I understand that. And that's, that's a, kudos to you. It's, it's a good motivation, but it is a cinematic universe. You're, you're setting it up. So you will always hear me call it the DCCU, the DC Cinematic Universe. That is what I will personally always call it, um, no matter what DC wants us to call it. But anyway, I digress. Let's get back to the question, shall we? Uh, the beginning of the DC Cinematic Universe, and people would be curious. However, Man of Steel could hurt it. Man of Steel currently sits at 55% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is below The Incredible Hulk, and it also earned less money than it was projected. Civil War has lots going for it, too. Um, but... Uh, has lots going forward too. The debut of Black Panther, unconfirmed Spider-Man appearances. By the way, the Spider-Man appearance is confirmed. Spider-Man is appearing in the film. Perhaps the Red Hulk, Iron Man versus Cap, etc. However, Age of Ultron may have left some fans disappointed. Well, here's the thing: we, we sometimes you hear us talk on Movie Talk about Batman versus Superman versus Captain America: Civil War, which one will have the biggest opening weekend box office. That is a what will have the biggest opening weekend box office is a question that we can address a little more surely, I guess you could say. Because what we can gauge and what we can look at and what we can measure is, you know, the, the, the trailers that have come out, the fan anticipation, what we're coming off of. So we can give a little bit of an educated guess as to uh, a little bit of an educated guess, because even then we're, we're still guessing. It's still a guess. But we can give a little bit more of an educated guess about opening weekend box office. However, if you're going to ask the question of ultimately which one will make more money, that is a total shot in the dark guess. The, because what will really determine which of those two movies makes more money will come down to which is the better film. Look, if we're talking about which one will make the most money on opening weekend alone, I still believe quite firmly that Batman versus Superman will make more money on its opening weekend for a lot of the reasons you mentioned. This is the first time Batman and Superman have been on the big screen together ever. It's crazy to think about that considering how long we've had a Superman movies and how long we've had Batman movies. This is going to be the first time ever we have Batman and Superman on the same thing. And look, I, everybody knows I'm a huge Marvel fan. I'm a big Marvel fan. Uh, some people accuse me of being a Marvel fanboy, which I am not. Actually, I am a Marvel fanboy and I'm a DC fanboy at the same time. But even though I am a huge Marvel fan and I love it almost, every, almost <laughs> everything Marvel has done up to this point, there's no denying the two biggest names easily like it's not close the two biggest names in the superhero neighborhood are batman and superman they are the two kings of the hill they are the big two and to have them both in the same movie this is the movie we've been wanting for ever since i was a lot younger when the dark knight well, you've heard me tell the story but when the dark knight returns uh, first came out and we saw batman fight superman we, that's the movie we've wanted to see, at least for me. I'll just speak for myself. That is the movie I've been wanting to see. 
And like even in that uh, Will Smith movie, I'm forgetting the, the name of it, but uh, the, the, the you know the one where everybody turns into zombie vampires. Anyway, um, even in that movie, it's supposed to be like a year or two in the future. And you see Will Smith walking through the city and a big movie billboard in the background is Batman versus Superman. Because even back then they knew that's the movie people wanted to see. And I think that is going to have a huge impact on its opening weekend. And it doesn't hurt that that trailer to Batman versus Superman is spectacular. Like, I like Star Wars a lot more than I like Marvel or DC. But even I, as a Star Wars guy, I got to tell you, that Batman vs. Superman trailer was better. It just was. It was better than the Star Wars trailer. The Star Wars trailer is spectacular. But that Batman vs. Superman trailer is one of the best trailers I've seen in a long time. And uh, I'm, I just cannot be more stoked for that movie. Now, you mentioned things, oh, so, uh, you know, Man of Steel will hurt it. Nah, Man of Steel won't hurt it. Man of Steel was a magnificent film. And even though a lot of my colleagues in the, uh, in the Film Critics Society didn't like it, Whatever, I'm not going to go into that whole spiel again. Um, the majority of film critics did like it. And the fan response has been a lot higher than the critic response was. Generally saying, I, it's not like the, the prequels. It's not like the Star Wars prequels, which which will have an impact and will hurt it. But uh, Man is not going to hurt it. I also don't think Avengers Age of Ultron is going to hurt it. Yeah, some people walked away to satisfied. I still thought it was a great movie. I just think some people with Age of Ultron, I think some people walked away disappointed because it wasn't as good as the first Avengers movie. But it's still a really good movie. And I think sometimes that happens. People walk out of a movie that was a 9.5, and then they go see its sequel, and the sequel's an 8. And they go, oh, man. And they feel walk away disappointed, and they just think negatively about the film. The movie was still an 8! It was still really good! Um, and so that's one of the things that we as film fans, I do it myself too, I'm, I'm guilty of this, where we... We fail to be a little bit more objective. All film is subjective, but I mean a little bit more objective. is like, hey, man, if we walked into the movie and said it was going to be an 8 out of 10, that's spectacular. That means you had a great time at the theater. But we convince ourselves that it wasn't a good time at the theater because it wasn't as good as the last one. And anyway, um, I actually, I remember the first time I walked out of Age of Ultron, it was, I, I went to a, a screening at Disney and on the Disney studio lot. And I remember walking out, I remember thinking, I might have liked that better than the first one. Then I thought about it more and thought about it more. I was like, oh, okay, maybe it wasn't as good as the first one. Maybe it was almost as good. Then I saw it again, and I still super liked it. But I went, okay, you know what? No, it, it's not as good as the first Avengers. It's not. Uh, but I still really enjoyed it. So I don't think Age of Ultron is going to hurt Captain America Civil War at all. I think these are going to be both huge movies. I think they're going to be massive. I think they're going to be big. But I just think it's way too soon to call which one we think will do the most business, i.e. which will get the most interest in the fan community to go out more times to see it. We just can't take a guess until we know which one's the better film. So after we see Captain America Civil War for the first time, and after we see Batman vs. Superman for the first time, then we'll be able to take some guesses. I was like, okay, I think this one will make more than this one ultimately. But for right now, I'll just stick to making a prediction, a guess at which one will make the biggest opening weekend box office. And for that, I'll stick with Batman vs. Superman. All right, thanks for the question. Let's move on to the next one. And the next question today comes to us from Abi Belipa, who writes, Have you guys heard any news about a part of a third part for the 300 series. I love the first two, and the ending was absolutely awesome, but I know a lot of people do not share my opinion, so did they pull the plug on the part three or not? Well, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Abby. Um, first of all, they never pulled the plug on part three because part three was never plugged in in the first place. Um, I think when they were releasing 300 Rise of an Empire, I think they were hoping it would be great, and do huge box office numbers, and that they could do another one. As a matter of fact, uh, at the premiere, I remember um, uh, the star of 300 to uh, Sullivan Stapleton, I believe is his name. Uh, Sullivan Stapleton was say, was talking about it. He goes, man, I hope we do another one. I love doing this. I want to be in this franchise, blah, blah, blah. But he never said they were planning on another one. And 300 Rise of an Empire did not do magnificent business. I think it made the money, but it didn't do great, but certainly a lot less than the first 300 did. It did not get the critic or the audience response that the first 300 did. And it, it wasn't as good of a film as the first 300. But I like the second, I like 300 Rise of an Empire. 
I thought it was pretty badass. I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was anywhere near as good as the first 300, but I thought 300 Rise of an Empire was actually pretty damn good. I had fun watching it. It was a step down from the first 300, no doubt. But I had fun. And I, while I really did like uh, Sullivan Stapleton's performance in 300 Rise of an Empire, I, ne I never thought going into the movie that he was a good fit for that role. And even coming out of the film, even though I liked the performance he brought in the movie, I still kind of felt like he wasn't the right fit. You know, talented dude, gave a good performance. I enjoyed him in it. Yet I still kind of felt he wasn't the right guy. Not that he wasn't good enough of a guy, just not the right guy for it. So I think that hurt. And by the way, um, Sullivan's got a, a new show coming out. Remember, uh, you know that Jamie Alexander, the actress who plays Lady Sif in the Thor movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Anyway, she's got a brand new TV series coming out called Blind Spot, which I'm really fascinated by. I can't wait to see it. And uh, Sullivan Stapleton is actually going to be a regular, if I'm not mistaken, in that show. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. So, no. As far as I know, there are no plans for a, another 300 uh, film, and it never had the plug pulled because the plug was never pulled in. There was never any serious discussion about a third 300 film. Hope that helps. All right, let's move on now to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Gabriel Horowitz, who writes... Hey, Collider, been watching since AMC times and just love the show. Well, thank you so much, Gabriel. Anyway, since the Oscar season is coming up, October, November, December, do you think that great movies that came out early in the year, such as Ex, Ex Machina, will get forgotten? Since the buzz will be on the movies that are coming out at the time, do you think they will overshadow those films that come out earlier in the year? Or could it be remembered and nominated? One example of that is when the Grand Budapest Hotel came out around March, and uh, but that made that movie still got nominated. Would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. Thanks, and keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Gabriel. And honestly, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I have never bought into this theory that the Academy forgets about movies that come out earlier in the year. You mentioned yourself, Grand Bud Budapest Hotel. Just last year, what was the big darling movie at the Oscars? Boyhood. I mean, and, and if uh, Birdman didn't win, a lot of people thought B Boyhood was going to win that. It won a lot of Academy Awards last year. A lot of people thought it could have snagged the one for Best, uh, best Picture. Anyway, um, Boyhood came out, I think, in August, like in the summer movie season. And it was like the darling of the Oscar thing. This whole notion that the Academy forgets. You don't forget movies that come out. I don't forget. And if somebody asks you, what were the best movies of the year? Maybe you have to pause for a second and pull up, you know, an IMDb list of the movies that came out this year. But then you instantly remember. I, I don't I don't understand this, this philosophy that, that the Academy is filled with like a bunch of preschoolers who can't remember what they had for breakfast yesterday. I don't understand this mentality that... Oh, if it comes out earlier, the, the Academy forgets about it. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I do not buy into that theory at all. All right? I, you know, when, when studios think they have a movie that's going to get serious Oscar consideration, yes, those movies come out, you know, November, December, but that's not to keep it fresh in the Academy's minds. They put them there to capitalize when they know this movie's going to get Oscar buzz. It's so good. So let's put it closer to Oscar season so that Oscar buzz can help our box office. It's about the money. It's Hollywood's all about greed, and greed is good. Thank you, Michael Douglas. Greed works. Hollywood is all about the money. It's all about the money. Now, they're human beings who run these studios. Yes, they want the prestige of winning awards and all that kind of stuff. But their first concern is money. It's always their first concern. Always. No exceptions. The Hollywood Studios' primary, prime directive, if you will, to use Star Wars or Star Trek vernacular, is the cash. That's what it's all about. So, if they thought, you know... If we put this movie in December, it'll give us a better chance to win an Oscar because it'll be more fresh in the Academy's memories, but we might lose out on $5. Then they would say, screw it. We want those $5. Put it somewhere else. They put those movies in this, what we call now Oscar season, you know, late October, November, December. 
not because it's got to stay fresh in the Academy's minds, because they, they think that they can capitalize on the Oscar buzz to make a few extra bucks for their film. That's what it's about. Now, there's definitely no denying the human tendency of out of sight, out of mind. Absolutely, like, absolutely that is a part. That is a, but it's a small part. It's a small part. Like you said, Grand Budapest Hotel, Boyhood. These films prove that the Academy members can remember movies that came out a few months ago. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry about that at all. It's all about the money, and that's the reason they put it there. So yes, these films that opened earlier this year have a shot. But how good their shot is, we can't tell yet because we haven't seen the films coming out later. We haven't seen The Hateful Eight. We haven't seen The Revenant. We haven't seen a number of the big Oscar films yet um, to see how will the other films earlier this year measure up. We can see films earlier in the year and say, oh, well, that was spectacular. It should get an Oscar nomination. Well, you can't say that because it's all about in relation to how good the other movies are, too. And until we see the other movies, we can't really give an accurate guess. Now, if the Academy Awards were being held today, would uh, X Machina be considered, uh, you know, should it be considered for Best Picture? Absolutely it should. But let's see all the other films first to see how those ones measure up. All right, let's move on to the second last question of the day. And this question comes for, to us from Mia Dees. And Mia Dees writes, Hi, I love watching you all talk about movies every day. Keeps me excited for all the new ones coming out. Well, thanks so much, Mia. That's kind of what we want to do. My question is an Oscar-related one. Today, the honorary Oscar winners were announced, and I am very happy for Debbie Reynolds, Gina Rollins, and Spike Lee. I know it's hard to only pick three or four people a year, but my vote would have been for Doris Day. She seems to always get missed, even though she is beyond deserving. There are so many to choose from. If you got to vote this year, who would you have voted for? Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. You're right. It is very hard. They only give a couple out every year. <clears throat> the nice thing is, though, <clears throat> um, there's no time limit on when somebody can get one. So that's great. Um, me, if there's anybody that I still, I mean, I don't believe ever won an Academy Award, especially for directing, and that I would personally give one to, or I would have gone to, is Stanley Kubrick. Um, Stanley Kubrick is definitely a guy I think uh, I would have put up on that list. So, But once again, just because it didn't happen this year, that means it won't happen next year or the year after that or the year after that. But <clears throat> this is, I think this one is overdue. When you're talking about the guy who did, you know, Full Metal, full metal Jacket, Lolita, 2001 Space Odyssey, A Clockwork Orange, Spartacus for heaven's sake. Um, when you look at the filmmaker who gave us these types of movies, the fact that he doesn't have an Oscar is kind of crazy. And I, you know, almost every year, I look forward almost as much to hearing who the honoree uh, recipients are. It's a great way for the Academy to sit back and say, because, you know, you get a guy like Leonardo DiCaprio, we talk about this a lot. He's been nominated for Best Actor a number of times. But the Academy Award is like the hardest award to win. It is like it's next to impossible to win one. Because not only in a year do you have to give an incredible performance, you got to hope nobody else did a little bit better. And that's totally outside of your control. It's not like basketball where you can go down and score 50 points, but you can also come back and play defense. There's no playing defense in the Academy Awards. All you can do is give the best effort you can, put out the best performance you can, and just keep your fingers crossed and hope that another actor didn't happen to do a little bit better than you did that year. And with, you know, a lot of us will whine and complain, myself included, that how does Leonardo DiCaprio not have an Academy Award yet? Well, honestly, if you sit back and look, he shouldn't have won an Academy Award yet because each year there just happened to be somebody better, or sometimes two or three people better than he did. Even though he was magnificent, somebody else just did a little bit better. And that's tough. It makes it very hard to win. But, you know, the honorary Academy Awards are a great device for the Academy because that means, let's say, you know, a guy like Leonardo DiCaprio goes 15 more years, gets nominated three more times, and never wins. It's a great device and a tool in the Academy's belt to say, we can correct this and say, not that anything was ever wrong, but, you know, the body of work that Leonardo DiCaprio has given us over the years, this guy, if anybody deserves an Oscar on his mantle for his body of work. 
Um, and that's a great tool. So I almost look forward as much to every year the announcement of who the honoree uh, recipients are as uh, almost as much as the actual recipients. And that's a really cool thing. So thanks for the question. Thanks for bringing that up. All right. Our final question of the day comes to us from Vivian Barreto. And Vivian Barreto uh, writes, I have recently watched Mission Impossible and I love Rebecca Ferguson's character, Issa Faust. Uh, may be the best interpretation of a sexy, badass woman that I have ever seen. Although she has a lot of screen time, we don't know much about her past. So this character has a lot of opportunity to be further developed. I am thinking about the female version of James Bond, or Ethan Hunt for that matter, featuring a series of films with her adventures all over the world. Who do you think would be the best screenwriter and the best director to make that happen? Thanks, and keep up the filthy. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Vivian. Um, first of all, let me say, I, I, I'm not going to address the who would be a good writer for it and who would be a good director for it. I generally don't like those questions because anybody, any one of 100 good writers and any one of 100 good directors, um, step in, give them a shot, and they can do something good with it. So I'm not going to worry about who should write it, who should direct it. Any one of 100 or 1,000 really good writers, any one of 100 really talented directors, and there's your right answer, any one of them. Um, so I, I'm not really going to worry about that part. I don't know. Look, I really liked Rebecca Ferguson in Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation. But I, I thought the character was great as a supporting character. Just like I think Simon Pegg's character is, is awesome as a supporting character. I don't know that I would run out and watch a Benji standalone film. I think his name was Benji in the movie. Anyway. Um, I, I'm not sure I would run out and watch that movie. I love the Ving Rhames character in Mission Impossible. I'm not sure I'm running out and getting all excited to see a standalone movie of the Ving Rhames character. So, I, and I, I put, you know, Rebecca's character in that same league. She was a great character, but I don't know that I'm jumping up and down to go and see her do her own um, character. Now, that's not to say that I don't think we need a, like a good female James Bond. Not that I want James Bond to be female, but a female version of James Bond. Now, as a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, there was this really cool story, and it was true, but I think it's been derailed. But the actress Ellen Page was in talks to star in um, this movie version of a graphic novel called Queen and Country. And the character's name was Tara, uh, Boy Tara Chance was Tara Chance, and, and the uh, the story was Queen and Country, where basically she's a female James Bond. She worked, I believe the character worked for MI6. Um, and it's not in the same cinematic universe as James Bond. There is no James Bond in that universe. But And Ella, Ellen Page was in talks to star in that. And I remember, I was fascinated by that. I think we need a movie like that. I think that type of movie would be really cool. Now, I'm a big Ellen Page fan, huge Ellen Page fan. I, I don't know how I would have bought her as like a badass super spy considering how petite she is. I, I might have had a little bit, but hey, you know what? Um, Scarlett Johansson is not a large specimen either. She's a, she's a really small girl and she carries off badass amazingly on screen. So maybe Ellen Page would have worked brilliantly for it. But I was really fascinated about that movie. I, that movie had my attention and then I never heard anything else about it. So I would love to know if you guys have ever heard more about or where the development of Queen and Country is right now. If they, you know, if they're still moving ahead with it, if they just switched actresses, I, I don't know. But if you guys have heard of anything about that, please, by all means, let me know. I would love to hear it. All right, folks, that will do it for me for this Saturday edition of Mailbag. I got to go get ready to do some auditions now for our recap network, which I'm so excited about. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, you should subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's easy, it's free, it's great. It'll keep you up to date on all the shows, our Monday through Friday, Movie Talk, Heroes, Jedi Council, Mailbag, and of course now our Recap Network as well. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel, simplest thing, and we'll keep you up to date on everything going on. Hey, did you guys know that we have an Instagram account? Just go on Instagram and you can start following us at Collider Video on Instagram. And Collider has a Facebook page. Make sure you're following and like our Facebook page. And of course... If you want to keep up to date on what I'm doing, on all the things going on behind the scenes, I do a lot of stuff on my own personal social media, and you should just be following me at John Cambia. That's on Twitter or on Facebook, and you guys can follow me there.
So anyway, that'll do it for me, guys, for this installment of Mailbag. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Can't wait to see you again tomorrow. And until then, bye-bye.